All right, let's begin. Uh, good evening and welcome to this talk. Uh, to all those who have joined us. Tonight's uh, speaker is Professor Tithankar Roy, a scholar of international repute, now teaching at the London School of Economics. In his own words, Calcutta shaped his outlook. Shantiniketan made him human, and Trivandrum, where he studied at the left-leaning Center for Development Studies, made him a scholar. Growing up in Calcutta made him, and I quote, allergic to a distasteful side of Bengali modernity, the arrogance and short-sightedness with which the communists, with a fetish for the village, set out first to destroy Cap Calcutta's capitalist heritage, and then to mold the intellectual and cultural life of Bengal into a politically correct image. He has written 23 very well-regarded books till now, including The Crafts and Capitalism, Handloom Weaving Industry in Colonial India, A Business History of India, and also The Economic History of Colonialism with Lee Gardner. He's contributed to many other books and published innumerable artic articles, sorry. His topic tonight, climate and economy in India is an extremely relevant one for our times, as I'm sure you all know, but he will take us all the way back to 1880 and bring us to the present. Before I hand it over to him, I just uh, want to tell you that you can ask questions uh, during the course of the talk, talk by uh, typing them in the chat box, which is in the center of your screen. Uh, but can I please request you to keep those questions short and confine uh, yourselves to one question per person? Thank you. And over to you, Professor Rao. Thank you. Uh, but let me share my screen to begin with. Sure. Uh, yeah. I guess that's, uh, that's doing fine. Yes, it is. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Shorajit Babu, for uh, an excellent introduction. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Um, if uh, in, uh, under normal conditions, if um, the Bengal club asks me to give a talk, I will readily say yes, very quickly, um, not only because it's uh, such a heritage uh, institution, but also uh, for the prospect of a magnificent dinner um, afterward uh, in one of the club uh, restaurants. Um, uh, that, uh, I, well, these are not normal conditions, so, uh, um, but, uh, um, uh, don't worry, uh, uh, just before my next trip to your city, I will remind the hosts of their sacred duty to feed the lecturer. Sure, sure. And uh, possibly here. Yeah. Okay. But, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I describe myself as an economic historian, so maybe a word about what economic history do does will be a good uh, point to start with. Um, like uh, much of economics, uh, economic history uh, tries to understand the origins of uh, economic growth and inequality in the modern world. But um, unlike economics, which is uh, quite um, well uh, concerned with the present, with what is measurable, economic historians believe that uh, these origins are embedded in the deep past and uh, you need different methods to uncover them. Um, so the relationship between economics and economic history is somewhat like uh, the relationship between um, a doctor and a psychoanalyst. Uh, the doctors, like doctors, uh, economists often look at symptoms, um, does uh, tests, and uh, then prescribes medicine for problems, for contemporary problems, which um, often make the disease worse. Um, but, and economic historians are much wiser. I mean, they are usually concerned about history and long-term long changes. Um, one of these uh, deep roots of uh, growth and inequality is uh, geographical because geographies don't change very easily. And what I'm going to do in this talk is to suggest um, that the um, modern Indian economic history or modern Indian history cannot be understood completely without uh, some sense of how the impact of geography has changed in this region and uh, also to suggest that that change came uh, at a price. So uh, to start with the context, here is a, um, let me start with, with something that might look like a puzzle. Um, in, in, in the words of, of a colonist, uh, a region famous for droughts and famines in the past, drought proofed itself around 2010. That is, there was no significant 
episode of dryness and dryness causing uh, uh, disastrous consequences uh, in the modern times. Um, in fact, this is not a recent uh, achievement. Uh, drought, in the drought meaning a widespread water shortage uh, causing famines was quite common uh, before 1900 in this world, but it disappeared. Drought induced famine appeared after 1900. So that is a fact, and there's not much dispute about this happened. The puzzle is that the proximate conditions, the geographical conditions which caused droughts and um, in the past led uh, droughts to develop into famines hasn't disappeared. If anything, they have become worse than before. As you can see from the statement that global warming uh, makes uh, heat wave episodes more likely and more frequent in India. So uh, the answer is that, um, the answer to the puzzle is that uh, geography hasn't changed but something has changed in the quality of distribution of water, which made uh, this achievement possible. But then you also have these statements that uh, there is a serious environmental crisis building up, for not, not just recently, but for quite, for quite some time, which leads to widespread water scarcity. So surely this achievement has come with a cost and uh, my uh, talk will really um, try to understand, try to connect these uh, four elements and give you a story about what the achievement was about, what, caught, what produced it, and also what kind of consequences are leading out of it. Okay, um, to um, tell you the story, give you the gist of the story in short and right away uh, before I get into some of the details. The story has two parts. One uh, deals with water access and another deals with water stress. And I will define these terms as I uh, uh, go along. Um, economic historians and economists measure long-term economic change, uh, long-term change in levels of living with uh, things like average income or human development uh, index. Um, this, I believe, is a very partial, very wrong way of understanding how tropical societies' uh, levels of living actually change. And one, a big part of that, um, a big part of uh, the conditions of life here is water access. And that must enter any measure of levels of living in the, uh, in the long run. Water access was extremely unequal in, until the mid-19th century, possibly the end of the 19th century. Over the next century or a little more, water access increased on average. Distribution became fairer, and that led to increased life expectancy, urbanization, and the conditions of intensive agriculture during the evolution. However, the process led to a stress on limited resources, especially groundwater, uh, more recently. And that uh, pressure has become extremely severe in some regions overall as uh, there's been a bigger and bigger draft on groundwater. And I'll, I'll tell you why uh, that, uh, that particular uh, development happened. Um, there is a, there's an economic uh, theory and economic history discourse on um, resource depletion of the kind that I'm talking about. Usually that is approached by a construction called the tragedy of the commons. Um, the tragedy of the commons is, um, broadly speaking, a narrative, a story which says that there was a kind of golden age of, um, uh, of uh, administration of the commons like groundwater or like common pools of water um, by cooperative or community-based community uh, means. And uh, at some point, these instruments broke down, the market principle entered, leading to more uh, assertion of private rights on these commons and leading to exploitation of resources. Now, this story does not fit the one that I'm going to tell you about India. Um, in, in, in the, the initial condition was not, a, not one of fair distribution at all. It was one of brutal uh, inequality and water deprivation, which uh, began to end from around 1900, uh, very slowly, very um, there were quite a few uh, reverses as well, but in the long run, it did weaken 
and leading to very significant welfare gains for a large number of people. However, the means adopted to weaken it imposed some costs on a fundamentally vulnerable geography of water supply. And that is where the environmental costs uh, came from. Okay, so there are three questions here. Why, why does distribution of water matter? And the answer is that uh, it matters because of the particular climatic and geological condition of India. And that is what I'm going to explain next. The second question is, how did it change? How did these conditions or the impact change? And the third question is, why is the change worrying? Now, um, moving to climate and geology, I'll, I'll uh, uh, describe the particular condition that occurs in South Asia in comparison with a Western city. The last time I gave this talk was uh, for an audience at Utrecht University. So the, so the compare, comparing um, uh, town is Amsterdam, but um, depending on where I give this lecture to, I change that city to London or New York, it doesn't matter. I mean, you have the same message coming through every time. The um, climatic uh, condition of uh, South Asia is sometimes described as tropical monsoon, and that's a uh, sort of a technical definition based on evaporation rates and uh, heat and temperature and rainfall. Now, um, on, on the chart to the left, I show maximum temperature in, uh, in a tropical monsoon city like Delhi and a Western uh, temperate zone city like Amsterdam. And the, the word tropical means that the average temperature is greater throughout the year and rises to quite high levels, 40 degrees Celsius plus, for uh, at least uh, three or four months in a year. Now that is, that's what being on the tropics uh, does to you. It's extreme heat and extreme heat dries up a lot of surface water sometime during the year. I mean, one way of understanding the difference between uh, a city like London, which has a very similar temperature profile as Amsterdam, and a city like Delhi would be um, to use this example. And London draws almost 70% of its drinking water from a series of tanks, uh, which are located uh, around the city. Uh, now imagine what happens uh, if uh, these tanks dry up every year for about four or five months in a year. I and mean, currently they don't. I mean, you can use this tank system precisely because evaporation rate is very small, relatively speaking, in this region than in Delhi. But that whole system of storing water, supplying water, doesn't quite work in a tropical city or a tropical region because the temperature is so high. Now, the second chart shows average rainfall. And this is an interesting chart because it shows that if you measure the total quantity of rainfall, you are likely to see that this region is not really water scarce. I and mean, the India or South Asia is not really water scarce um, uh, on, on, a, on, a, on an overall scale. But the uh, rainfall is extremely concentrated seasonally. 80% of the rainfall happens in about three months in a year. Now, when you have such extreme seasonality in rainfall, and that is, that's the, the combination of these two features is tropical monsoon. When you have this extreme seasonality, uh, the problem is that during the dry season, it's much surface water dries up. And uh, then um, there is a question of recycling and storing water, recycling them between seasons. And these systems are often very expensive and you can create them, but they're not easy to create. Now, um, another way of um, um, of describing, uh, describing the tropical monsoon situation would be to look at this map, which is not very clear, but it will uh, allow us to make this point. If you, if you look at this map, I mean, there are, the, the map comes to two sets. I mean, one showing you average evaporation rate in May, and another, uh, the right picture shows you average evaporation in, in the month of August after the monsoon breaks. The uh, darker red, colors show extreme dryness. That means very small evaporation rate. There is no surface water at all. That's what they show. And of course, all 
the major deserts will give you very dark red color and they are, most of them are based uh, in the tropics. Um, now you can see that uh, for much of the South Asia region has an extremely red, extreme, uh, extreme dryness, um, the dark red, orange, brown color coding during May. So they, it, that region resembles uh, one of the world's uh, arid uh, deserts during May. And then things change very dramatically in August. It uh, becomes very green or very blue. That is, there's a lot of sun. dramatic transformation within a few months. That's the point that I want to make through this chart. But there are a few other regions which do show this pattern. And one of them is uh, located, if you look closely at this map, uh, several thousand miles horizontally east to west, there is a belt just south of the Saharas. That's part of the Sahel region, which uh, shows a very similar profile as India. Uh, it has a monsoon, Sahel has a monsoon and Sahel, uh, also has this uh, transformation, rather less dramatic one than India because Sahel is, uh, doesn't get a, as much rainfall as India does. Now, what this uh, transformation tells you is, um, is, is this problem that I uh, described before, uh, that the, the region is not exactly water scarce, but be, because of this extreme uneven seasonality, it gets a seasonal scarcity of water. And uh, when you have a seasonal scarcity of water, you have to solve it by creating water recycling systems, which are often uh, quite expensive. And that is South Asia's problem. It has, it has been a problem for a long time. Or alternatively, you can dig underground and access water. Much of, much of it is monsoon water that seeps underground. But once again, that is, that's quite expensive. Now talking about um, digging underground, um, it's, it's a good, good point to, talk, to discuss uh, the geological situation in a bit uh, more detail because that contributes to the water problem to some extent. Now, I am uh, making a very um, broad simplification here in dividing the South Asia region into two main geological systems, if you like. I and mean, one of them is the occurs um, in the floodplains of the Indus and the Ganges rivers, that is the Indo-Gangetic Basin. It, along the coasts uh, in the in the river deltas, where you find soft soil, where the, the rainfall is much uh, better, and uh, there is also more perennial water sources in the deltas because the rivers always carry water. Uh, if you are in the Gangetic Basin, then you are uh, you can access one of the rivers which get uh, snow melt water from the Himalayas. That's again perennial, and because that region. Uh, contains very um, deep alluvial soil, it's soft soil, and there is a lot of uh, moisture in the soil. Um, it's very easy to dig a well there. And uh, village wells are an extremely common site. They have been a common site for a very long time. And here you have a late 19th century photograph of a village, village well in the UP region. When you move to the Southern part of India, the um, the condition of water supply changes dramatically. Um, all of these conditions that I described, soft soil, more rain, um, more perennial water sources from so snow melt and village well, they disappear. Uh, the conditions are completely different. The, uh, the Deccan region, much of south southern uh, peninsula region consists of two different uh, geological systems. One of them is the volcanic uh, uh, rock system that comes from, that's called the Deccan Trap. And uh, the other is the, uh, this ancient uh, Gondwana continent, which uh, hit the uh, Eurasian uh, plate sometime uh, maybe 50 or 60 million years ago. And, uh, but, but both of them, uh, they are quite different systems. They have different soil conditions, but both of them have one similarity. They have very hard rock formation. And uh, in the trap area, the water occurs between rock layers. So if you want to access groundwater, then you have to dig through this hard rock. And that is what makes it, makes it quite difficult to access water. There is no snow melt. There are, of course, massive river systems. Godavari and Krishna and its tributaries are enormous. But they don't get any snow melt water. 
And uh, the, uh, I mean, if you look at some of these rivers, which are really very big, not in the deltas, but in the inland, um, in the winter or in the dry months, they become a series of shallow pools. Um, so the river water volume fluctuates quite a lot. So it's not a very reliable, the surface water or river water is not a very reliable source for meeting seasonal shortage of water. Um, groundwater is much more um, reliable and uh, the Southern India also has uh, this huge uh, man-made tanks, um, well, large and small, some of them are very, very big. Both these systems of accessing groundwater, that is digging a well in the Deccan Plateau and, uh, or creating a tank are extremely expensive. You cannot do that with private resources. You can dig a village well in UP with private resources. Many rich farmers did that. Almost everybody did that. Uh, very few people in the southern peninsula region did that. So that's the uh, that uh, the the, uh, the Deccan water problem has a special dimension, and that's what I wanted to show here. The picture below shows one of these uh, South Indian tanks. Um, you can see that the the scale of these um, constructions were very large at one time, but um, but they are very high maintenance, and uh, they do not always. I mean, if you if they are not. Of a, of a sufficient size, they don't answer this seasonal water problem very well. Water dries up during, during uh, dry months. Now, uh, what these slides tell us about economic growth is that the initial condition in India was quite grim. And by initial condition, I'm talking about a date like 1850. Uh, intensive agriculture was not possible almost anywhere in monsoon tropics. Um, by intensive agriculture, I mean uh, a countryside that could, where people could work for 250 or 280 days in a, in a year. Uh, that condition was not, uh, did not really exist in this time. Um, even in the mid 20th century, when for the first time this data was systematically collected, the number of working days in uh, the Indian countryside was extremely small, 150, 180, something like uh, that figure would be the average. Now, um, most people in the countryside were poor for the simple reason that the working year was short. And if they lived in or near the Deccan region, then not only was the working year, not only were people poor because they didn't have enough work throughout the year, but also there was a high risk of dying from drought and famine because if the rains fail, surface water dries up, there is no other option. There's, there's nothing else. Most wells were privately owned and tanks often dried up. Towns and cities lived and died depending on their local water bodies. I mean, this is a basic fact of Indian history and you, you can go back to uh, descriptions of medieval cities or uh, cities until very recent times and uh, find evidence of how, how close, how, intensely um, uh, urban life depended on, uh, a, a, on a natural water body um, nearby. And when anything happened to that body, the city would be dead. Um, there are many examples of uh, death of cities of this kind in the South Asia region. Now, from that initial condition, um, four forces combined at the turn of the 20th century to ease these conditions and create conditions for fairer distribution of water. What are these four sources? One of them was famine relief measures, and I'll talk about them briefly, serially in this order. The second was equality movements, which focused on water access rights very close, very strongly, and partly as a legacy of the uh, famine relief uh, literature that emerged around 1900. The third was uh, law courts, um, case laws, and the fourth was uh, large scale water works uh, schemes, especially starting with urban administration, that is the city water supply in Bombay, Calcutta, to some extent Madras um, uh, and, and, and a few other cities received this very large scale piped water system, which reduced their dependence on seasonal water supply quite significantly and also improved the safety of the water that people drank there. Now, so these are the four things. You can see that um, nowhere is the state 
um, directly involved, or uh, I mean, none of this is uh, is a result of uh, uh, of a discussion of a kind of top top level discussion on policy, how we should solve this problem, what is the problem, and and a response that is designed at the top. Um, a, quite a few of these forces were very bottom up, and especially equality movement was a was a very bottom up source, but they converged, and they converged because. Um, the mass media of the time understood the water problem, especially in the Deccan region, and uh, were often uh, uh, exploring different instruments for uh, finding a solution to the water problem. So uh, very briefly, what was going, going on here? Now, the famine relief story is this. Um, as all of you know, the, uh, I mean, India experienced um, very um, severe um, uh, famines in the Deccan Plateau, uh, well, in, in, in South Southern India, the, the, in, between 1876 and 1899, there were three massive episodes which together killed millions of people. Uh, the 1876 one happened in the Southern Andhra districts. That, that was the epicenter, then it spread. Um, that was uh, much further south. But the other two, 1896 and 98, happened in the Deccan Trap region, which is the area in the northwestern part of the Deccan Plateau, much of uh, present-day Maharashtra. Now, in the, uh, the, the reason why these famines are um, often seen as a kind of um, watershed in Indian economic history is not because they were particularly severe. I mean, we, we don't have enough data to know how, how bad they were compared with past famines, because there's not enough data on the past famines. But uh, from all we know, famines of this severity did happen before. Um, and uh, it's not as if they were um, very special in terms of the scale in which they happened. However, they were special in the scale of documentation that they produced, the kind of data that they produced, partly because they became political scandals, partly because uh, the government response was extremely controversial. And in the end, uh, the government, the um, semi-governmental um, organizations, intellectuals, media, all produced a huge volume of data and description um, around these episodes. And that has, be, that, that has been a kind of main resource for researchers. I mean, we understand these famines much better than famines in the past. Now, what is that understanding? Of course, famines, um, we know from Amartya the Sen's work and everybody else's work is about food, but it is not. In the dry lands, in the dry Deccan, it was about water and very significantly about water. Not only water shortage, um, a repeated rain failure dried up surface water. That was the water problem. And it was very severe in South India. Not only was there a shortage, but when there was a shortage, people and livestock relied on the limited pools of common water that was available, which were often, often contaminated. So by 1890s, there was a very significant repeated waves of cholera that came from um, this problem, the famine problem. And uh, by 1890s, the understanding, or the official understanding uh, of what was, the, what was going wrong had changed from um, food scarcity, which can be handled by transporting food, and everybody was recommending more, um, uh, more uh, uh, railways and uh, more irrigation to grow more food, from food to water, and water cannot be transported. So that was a much bigger and much, much more difficult problem to solve. And the, the problem was made worse by an institutional reason, which is that uh, water I mean, when, when surface water dries up, I mean, what, what's the alternative left? It's wells, of course. But private property in water was a private property. It was legally protected. It was legally protected. It was ritually, culturally protect, protected. It was often a caste-based right. That is, a, a well in a Brahmin um, neighborhood is not accessible for the non-Brahmins because uh, um, not only because non brahmins do not have entitlement to, but it will be a sin for them to use this uh, well in the Brahmin neighborhood. And um, so both, uh, there were very strong forms of cultural entitlement and legal ownership rights that protected private property. 
The concept of a water famine was, um, as I said, it was a shortage plus disease. And it, it, was, it was evident very soon that the combination of this problem had an uneven effect and hugely unequal effect uh, across castes. That it's the mainly, uh, mainly the lower castes, oppressed castes, who were dying uh, during the famines. That's not food, that's water. Water was causing this inequality. Now, how do you solve this? I mean, there is no, um, there's no law and no law, no new legislation came which could make, which could turn private wells into a common property. But, uh, but the famine relief system faced this problem that we have to do something with the wells that are there and make them more accessible and they did try sequestration of wells, taking them over on a quite an extensive scale and established in, in, their, in their action, if not in their uh, uh, understanding of law, the, uh, the concept of the public trust, that something that is in the common is, uh, is, cannot be a private property. It has to be uh, a public, uh, under public regulation in some form. Now, as I said, I mean, the, the, the reason why uh, these famines became so famous episodes is that they produced enormous documentation and they became part of the public discourse of the time. Now, one of, one of the things that influenced this discourse very significantly was this statement that is quoted at top that as to the caste of those who died, the great majority are the Hindus of low caste. And by the time you come to the 20th century, when social reform movements were picking up, becoming more organized, um, this was beginning to play an extremely powerful role. And uh, of course, uh, I mean, you go a little deeper and you, and, and you begin to see that it's all about water access. So um, it's not just uh, social reform that is going to solve this problem, but you have to assert water access you have to assert access of the lower castes to the water resources, which are traditionally reserved for the upper castes. And um, that became uh, a, a point for a campaign point for the equality movements, the equal rights movements in the Deccan Trap region. And it's not by accident that some of the most significant, the strongest equality movements emerged in the Trap region. Um, this was a battle that was fought on the political plane. Um, the, the two pictures I show on, on, the, uh, uh, on, on, on the left are both uh, connected with one of the most significant of these political movements, the Mahad uh, Satyagraha, which was an attempt to forcibly uh, take water from a tank which belonged to a temple and had uh, protected uh, rights uh, by a group of um, so-called untouchables, led by B.R. Ambedkar, uh, 1927. And the uh, Mahat Satyagraha is, is a very significant event in Indian history because, um, not only because it established uh, Ambedkar as the um, most famous spokesperson for um, untouchable movements, but also it had enormous symbolic effect and it generated a chain reaction of a similar kind of groups of people forcibly uh, breaking into um, a well or a common pool, which had been um, uh, sort of semi-religious property or a caste property. Um, the picture, the, the colored picture shows uh, a commemorative uh, action, more recent times in the last few years, of uh, groups of people um, remembering the Mahat Satyagraha by going back to the same tank and drinking water from there. Now, this, this battle was not political yet. In the interwar period, you have several, several such episodes of forcibly going and sharing water, which were preserved, but um, it, was a, it was a much broader movement than that. I mean, if you look at what was being written in the media of this time, the media was getting very interested in these movements. If you look at what was happening in the courtroom, um, there are many stories of um, how, uh, many stories of how, uh, uh, somebody who had um, gone and drank from a temple tank was then sued for polluting religion and then the judge um, 
is kind of ambivalent. The judge doesn't really know what, what, which side, what side to take. And some judges uh, took the side of the temple, but some judges thought that, well, if I, if I accept this case, then basically all of India's rivers become inaccessible to most uh, people uh, on grounds of religion. So it, it's, it's quite crazy. Um, so a series of courtrooms, uh, courtroom, uh, court cases and series of political uh, movements um, contributed to this idea that the water should be a common property, water should be accessible to all. And it did produce effects. And with the, with the rise of provincial legislatures, um, this became uh, a campaign point that there should be more wells in the Deccan region and more wells which are accessible to all. It became a political demand. And uh, through these movements, um, the depressed caste movement, the depressed caste category became uh, the leads or it became a political subject uh, 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 and a development that uh, uh, is quite well written about. Now, the other thing that happened was uh, with, uh, especially with uh, of access to surface water. Uh, I mean, there, once again, I mean, there, it was not a planned movement, but through series of uh, separate laws, provincial laws, this eminent domain rule was, uh, came, to be, came into being that uh, something that can serve public trust will be under public regulation. But none of that solved the problem of wells. The well is still a pro private property. It still is a private property, but it draws on water that is common property. And that problem remained. That problem didn't get solved by uh, public trust. The famine relief measure I talked about established by action a kind of public trust principle, but it took more than a century for the Indian judiciary to accept it as, as a valid principle. Now, um, as for um, technology, as for state action, as for um, more coordinated ways of uh, supplying water, there were a lot of things that were done there. Um, if you study that history of what was done uh, in respect of uh, on, on the technological plane uh, to solve this uh, seasonal problem, um, you'll find probably three different things um, dominating three different phases of water history in India. The first would be, I would call the recycling model, uh, which focused on canals and gravity schemes, the piped water in cities, using geographical conditions to create storages that lasted for uh, uh, through the dry seasons. Um, the first major application of these uh, systems was in the Punjab canals and in the water supply systems of Bombay and uh, Calcutta. Um, Madras was a slightly different case because once again because of geography. But uh, in all of these, um, the moment piped water came into being, and piped water, of course, was a very was a much more equalizing system than private wells because you cannot identify the users by caste; you cannot discriminate in piped water. But um, the the problem with the cities was not water shortage anymore, but but the fact that the moment water security existed, there was a massive wave of migration, and that often created epidemic outbreaks in the cities. Um, the, the other model, the um, second model, which was ruling much of the mid 20th century was this big dam concept, um, which, was, which started being used on quite a big scale from the 1930s um, as a multi-purpose project producing electricity as well as storing water. But it was used quite recklessly in the Deccan Plateau where the rivers could not really take uh, many big dams, um, creating all, well over a thousand uh, dams on Krishna Godavari and their tributaries. Um, not surprisingly, by the end of the 20th century, they were a, a model that had died. I mean, they were high maintenance, they were uh, they caused inequality, they were environmentally damaging. The, then come to the more recent times of the uh, what I call the extraction model that, that is going deep underground, and you now have the technology of doing that. Almost all city apartments uh, recently built will have uh, used this system, which is go underground and get water. Um, this is wells have always been common in the water rich areas, but now it's the water scarce areas where you have a lot more wells and 
uh, very heavy dependence on the wells. And as there was uh, more dependence on wells, this old governance problem came back that the underground water is common property, but it's not treated as such. So if there is a depletion, there is no authority can come and tell you that uh, you, you do not have right to use to do this. And that's the management problem that is uh, being discussed in this uh, quotation. Now, the part two of this story can be very quickly told. Um, you cannot keep doing this. You cannot keep extracting water. You cannot keep redistributing water without any price to pay in a region which is fundamentally short of water. And here is the geographical situation. You can see that it's extremely stark. Um, there, is, there is an absolute shortage of renewable supplies in South Asia region compared with almost all other major world regions. That leads to the uh, prospect of something called water stress, which is the risk that if you keep drawing more, then you run into uh, shortages and also run into conflicts with uh, competing uh, right holders. And this, uh, this graph, which tells you that um, India is, well, drawing too much, also um, shows you the average temperature, which suggests that there is some, something geographical about, about uh, drawing too much. The history of stress in South Asia started with this um, critique of large dams. But uh, even before that, uh, many um, economists, geographers had observed that the too much dependence on surface water was putting pressure on the rivers and their health. But more recently, it has taken on a political aspect, these hydropolitical conflicts, which are extremely serious between India and China. Part of the current conflict between India and China has a water dimension um, and almost every other neighbor of uh, India's. And, uh, and then there is this, we come to the very modern times when there's a massive uh, concern about groundwater depletion. Finally, we have the data on groundwater. For a long time, we didn't have the data on how much there was underground, but now we have, and the predictions are extremely dire. So uh, to conclude then, this is the story in full. And I have here uh, more than 100 years data shown in two charts, one, um, giving, one measuring per capita water use, which has gone up, and the other measuring exploitable water available as a percentage of total water, which has gone down and gone down extremely sharply. Uh, is that chart going to change in the near future? Climate is going to change. And there is now a lot of speculation whether the story I told you is going to change in any significant way because of climate change, because of global warming. And there are quite a few models which um, give you slightly different predictions, but all of them suggest that the stream flow in rivers is going to increase, that precipitation transpira transpiration pattern will increase, that the seasonal, seasonality pattern will change. How does that translate into uh, water scarcity? In terms of volume, water scarcity will be less of a problem in the near future if uh, global temperatures rise. In terms of seasonality, um, the seasonal shortage might get worse if global temperatures rise. We still don't know the story very well enough. Um, okay, so um, just um, my final slide here is that, um, uh, I mean, if you, if you think of an action plan, I mean, what, what are the lessons for future that we can draw from the story of history? Well, the, the whole problem in India is that water access is a human right, but uh, water is uh, limited supply. And uh, therefore, uh, if you advocate rules or institutions limiting access, it's not going to work, um, which is why cooperation, politics, and law fails repeatedly to address this problem, the management problem that uh, economists talked about before. However, there are um, quite a few positive signs that uh, technology could have could come with a solution, like drip irrigation, for example. It doesn't work everywhere, but it's very promising or uh, that uh, we could do much more uh, cutting consumption. I think uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for this fascinating evening with the water history of India. Um, <clears throat> there are some questions already in the question box. Uh, so let me read out some of them to you. <clears throat> From okay. Rudra Chatterjee, and I think this question uh, he asked in the context of the two maps that you had shown of uh, rainfall in Amsterdam versus the rainfall in Delhi, where it was compressed within a much shorter period. 
So the question is, what is the economic consequence of this dramatic transformation of precipitation? For example, does it cause huge variation in crop seasonality with challenges to storage and distribution? Um, I, I, is that question about uh, climate change and the future? I mean, sort of speculating what might happen or? Uh, well, I think uh, the question, I mean, you said uh, at some point that right. two cities might have the same uh, rainfall, but in, yes. in Delhi, it is concentrated within a very short period. So he's asking That's right, if yes. it yeah. cause huge uh, crop variation, seasonality with challenges to storage and distribution. Yes, yes. Yes, um, I, I think, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the part that I did not develop fully is uh, the conditions of intensive agriculture. I mean, if you have very, very concentrated rainfall, then um, um, like uh, in most parts of India, uh, the, the simple message is that you can grow one crop, uh, one rain fed crop quite easily because there's plenty of moisture coming uh, down from the sky quite cheaply. But, um, but growing um, other crops, growing dry season crops is extremely difficult unless you have storage systems. And that's the obstacle to intensive agriculture. I mean, the, the reason why you have such short uh, working year, uh, 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 such small number of working days in a year in, in the countryside is just this, that uh, the rainfall seasonality is so skewed. But if you have uh, storage systems, then of course you have a green revolution. That's the whole principle that uh, you create either uh, wells or tube wells or canals and um, or tanks and make uh, and recycle water between seasons. This recycling problem is uh, is a very tropical monsoon problem. It doesn't exist. Uh, like what I meant by that question, Professor. Yeah, uh, it's. I'll give an example of tea. Yeah. It, Sri Lanka or Africa, where you have uh, high, because it's close to the equator, you know, long, more number of days with rainfall, you have yeah. the same crop of tea in a year is actually over 200 days versus say 100 days in India, which mm. means that the processing of the factory, the capacity that you need in India is far more than Africa. Yeah. So what is the consequence of you know, the high capex, high storage on Indian agriculture. That is basically, that was my question. Yes, well, um, no, we can discuss this. I think, um, um, I, mean, I mean, one of the one of the immediate things that comes to my mind is that the tea regions uh, do not suffer from seasonality in quite the same way as uh, the conventional agriculture does in the dry regions, because most tea regions are not dry uh, climate. Uh, if you go back to that map, you'll see that the, the two regions in India which doesn't face the seasonality problem of uh, extreme evaporation is uh, Bengal and uh, Assam and on one side and Kerala on the other side, and which is exactly where the plantation crops are based. Um, I guess it will be the same um, story in East Africa as well. Uh, but um, I mean, we, we can... We can can discuss the storage problem further on. I think there are other questions. Maybe. Yes, yes. Uh, if I could uh, get to some other questions, there are in fact many. Uh, from CC, uh, was there any indigenous water management initiative at all then? He yes. Talking about the uh, parks, was there any in yeah, yeah. indigenous uh, water management technology? No, that's um, that's that's a great question, and um, I mean this is this is um, um, this is a well, a, a form of response that uh, that uh, comes every time when I present this talk that, you know, what, what kind of uh, management systems we have uh, before. Well, the, the answer is that I don't know very, uh, very well. Uh, I don't think anybody knows um, what kind of microsystems there were. Um, the, uh, the limited studies that have been done focus on the South Indian tanks and some very micro kind of scale, micro scale uh, enterprises in the gadgeting basin. Now, um, what we are talking about here is not something that is purely a private good like a well, something that is not purely a public good like a canal or kind of semi-public good like a canal, but something in between where community and village uh, comes into play um, uh, or local, local power comes into play like South Indian, uh, South Indian tanks. Um, we don't know enough about the exact managerial systems, but we do know that uh, the way these communities function, they were not very egalitarian systems. So then they were, it was, they were not democratic. So, uh, I mean, they were not a sufficient 
um, reason to expect that the inequality that I'm talking about disappear because there were also strong caste-based and other, other rights, uh, even in community-based uh, systems. Right, this is a question by Dr. Julie Mehta. Her question in essence is that in Cambodia, and she is specifically talking mm. about the Siem Reap area, the roots of Angkor civilization, they share a, sim a similar tropical ethos as the Indian subcontinent, but how was it possible for them to reap four harvests of rice annually and be unaffected by severe drought? Some agrarian specialists have suggested that sandstone and permeable subsoil mm -hmm. could have done this, uh, but she is uh, she has researched this, but she is still not very sure about it. So, what would be your response? Yeah, and I, 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 this is uh, this is a very interesting fact that I think we uh, need to understand better. Um, uh, from my experience, um, I'm, I'm I'm not an expert on the Angkor uh, situation, but. Um, from my experience, it would, uh, this will not be terribly unusual. I mean, you have um, areas around uh, the core zone in the indo basin or in some of the tank uh, irrigated uh, deltas in South India, where you have similar um, intensive cultivation regimes that appear because the, uh, the water supply system that was largely man-made um, did actually, um, could, could deliver that kind of uh, intensive agriculture. But locally, um, these, uh, these uh, systems were not re uh, replicable on a very large scale. So you have usually a cluster of villages or maybe a, a area around the city uh, from which the city draws its, its taxes, of course, which could develop that, that kind of a system. And everybody has an interest in intensive agriculture. It's not that if the state had a solution, they will withdraw that solution uh, from um, being used. Um, in northern India, the, um, the Sultanate uh, kings uh, created canals, uh, but, but some of the systems were also very high maintenance and you needed uh, a sustained state power for a long time to create uh, a, a viable system. Right, and now I'm going to ask you two questions which may be related, although they're uh, pretty different. Uh, one is from Mr. Pradeep Kakkar, who's asking, who is the legal owner of river water? It's flowing, uh, so it's a public good. And um, from Obhirup Sharkar, why didn't a ma market for water develop? Was it because those who wanted water, the lower castes, did not have the money to buy it? Okay, well, um, <clears throat> on, on the river water, it's a very interesting uh, question because uh, there was uh, this series of cases about Ganges water, who owns Ganges water? Um, that were recently uh, settled, uh, recently meaning about 10 or 15 years. And that brings up this whole question about who owns river, river water and who is the custodian. Of course, um, um, nobody owns the river, river water because river flows through many uh, people's property and uh, many states. But who is the custodian? And once again, that problem comes up. Uh, I mean, who can be a trustee of river water? And uh, in India, again, that becomes embroiled in the interstate disputes. But uh, I think one of there was one of one Supreme Court case where the Ganges was declared as a Gonga was declared as a as a person um, uh, and um, a, a legal a legal entity. I mean that's 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 the meaning of that. I mean, Gonga as a as a person means that she uh, is the owner of uh, what water she contains. But um, that's of course a legal fiction. I mean the next question is that if you if you have a person if you are a person of a owning a property, but you're gonna manage it yourself, somebody else will manage it on your behalf. And uh, then the question of custodianship comes in. And this, this is a complicated legal area. It, it's not as if India, this kind of cases have, they have happened in India for the first time, but it's part of, it's a kind of subplot in this general environmental story about how you um, conserve, uh, how you regulate water use. And um, I don't think it's still a resolved area. Uh, but, um, on, on, on the water market, well, from the late 20th century studies, we know that water markets can come up when the conditions exist. Um, in Gujarat, there are extensive surveys of water markets. Um, my own sense is that, I think your, your question kind of has the hint of an answer. My own sense is that markets work uh, among, uh, between people who are of similar circumstances and interests, people who share, share and in markets, and, um, and of course, who can pay. Uh, markets don't work or markets fail when an absolute scarcity 
depending on Femi, then it's a question of survival. And uh, almost anybody who has access will try to protect access rather than sell it uh, because it's, uh, it's a subsistence. And uh, partly because of that, but partly also, I think, because of the ritual rights uh, that um, uh, the markets, uh, I mean, we, are, we don't know of a water market in, uh, in the countryside during the famines. We do hear for the first time water markets appearing in the cities. And uh, there, of course, uh, there are more similarly, um, uh, well, people of similar economic um, uh, conditions, situations, interests who can deal in this market. Right. Uh, two more questions, uh, which uh, are along similar lines. From Praveen Dashgupta, what could be the potential impact on water usage from technology and uh, new processes such as recycling, desalination of seawater, cloud seeding, etc. And from Pratap, I understand that a few countries use seawater after proper treatment. Can the cities in India, like Bombay or Chennai, which have access yeah. to seawater, use similar technology to solve at least part of the problem? Thank you for a fascinating session, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very, thank you very much. I, I, I won't pretend to be an expert on the technology of water recycling uh, and its future potentials. That's not my strength. But as part of this story, uh, of course, um, I'm very keen to understand what the future looks like, and especially a future where um, the conditions for su supply may become um, less certain than before because of global warming. And um, I can see that uh, <clears throat> there's a variety of technologies which are being tried uh, the, uh, it's one thing to make a technology work, and it's quite another thing to make a technology economical. Um, I'm not sure that we have got to that point where we can clearly answer whether this is economical to use, um, whether, uh, I mean, any system of recycling. However, uh, probably the most promising one is, um, is um, a drip irrigation type of irrigation of, of systems, which can significantly cut down on water use in um, uh, in, in dryland agriculture. That has been tried with uh, quite um, dramatic success. Once again, it is expensive and it doesn't work for some reason everywhere in all drylands. Um, but it is, um, it's something that is, uh, that's becoming much more popular than before. Uh, whether the, the, the problem is that many wetlands or many um, irrigated agricultural systems won't readily adopt these technologies because it costs money and it doesn't make sense to use because you already have your own well. Um, it doesn't matter whether you are overexploiting the underground water because you don't see that overexploitation. And if nobody stops you, then keep doing it. Um, so there is that uh, management problem as well. Right. Uh, so, uh, next question from Chaitali Mukherjee. What uh, I think she's asking is that uh, there are differences in the distribution of water resources and irrigation systems uh, between uh, the Indo-Gangetic and the Gondwana divisions. Mm -hmm. So are these related to the crop production of these two different uh, regions? Oh, yes, of course. And the, much of the Deccan region is um, traditionally millet growing. So that's uh, drylands, uh, dryland crops, millet and cotton. Um, these, uh, can, um, uh, these are the most important uh, uh, crops that are coming from uh, the Southern Indian region. Except the, except the delta ike regions. I mean, we, we leave the coasts and deltas out, which have been growing rice for a long time. But uh, the inland uh, rain shadow area and the Krishna Godavari uh, floodplains, these are mainly uh, cotton and millet growing regions. The, uh, <clears throat> and uh, wheat, rice, um, vegetables, I mean, everything else, uh, shrub, of course, uh, consumes an enormous quantity of water. I mean, you just can't, can't grow them anywhere. Um, and that's much more of an Indo-Gangetic basin crop. The thing is that now things have stopped because you have uh, much, much more um, reliance on groundwater, which has changed to some extent. But, uh, but the millet as a, as a basic base for dryland and South Indian agriculture still stays. I mean, that that's, that's still uh, is the situation in the present times. Right, since we have already detained you for an hour, I'm just going to ask uh, three more questions. Uh, of course. Uh, from Shomujit Mukherjee, did the introduction of commercialization of agriculture in India uh, affect the infrastructural uh, development of water preservation? Well, 
Yes, although I think the causation goes the other way around. I mean, you have needed um, canals and needed, um, uh, well, mainly canals uh, that uh, could contribute to uh, commercialization. Or uh, if there is any land frontier left in the water rich regions like Bengal, uh, parts of de the Delta X, South India, then you have uh, expansion in, in uh, cropland. Um, <clears throat> but uh, to some extent, there was causality as well. I mean, if you have commercial, in UP, for example, um, people sold crops, became somewhat rich, and then uh, they had a well they could afford, it, and well would then sustain maybe, uh, which is a which is an extremely water rich crop. So there was uh, there was that kind of um, cycle uh, as well. But, uh, by and large, I think uh, water came first and uh, commercialization next. Right, from Andrea Day, uh, what I think she is asking is that did the boom that the Indian economy experienced in the 80s and 90s have anything to do with the use of the extraction model that you talked about? And if so, how? Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, that was a missing um, sentence in my presentation. It, it did. The, the late 20th century economic reforms, concentration of urban wealth, uh, and if you observe where this wealth concentrated, you will find that a lot of it was in the cities in the, in the Deccan uh, region, uh, South Indian region, which were naturally scarce. Um, the, 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 whole, uh, uh, the whole model of uh, water supply was the extraction model. Um, I mean, I mean, there are some of these older cities like Hyderabad and Pune, which uh, had an older type of water supply, is very heavily on groundwater, despite having two tanks uh, around itself, which are polluted. But um, but by and large, it's not just um, the dryland cities; uh, it's everywhere. If you look at happening in the the richest um, <clears throat> the richest apartment blocks you will find that they are uh, expensive and uh, they are uh, elite because they have their own water system. And that is an extraction system. If you remember the one of the photographs, which I didn't describe, I mean, there was a massive under construction apartment building, and then there was a vehicle uh, orange colored right part just in front of it. And that was, that was actually a boring um, uh, vehicle. I mean, it was going, going to uh, dig a well first. Um, so that is the model. And uh, what that means is that some of the richest um, Indians, who are of course an extremely powerful lobby, uh, do not really worry about uh, underground water because they have plenty of access to it. I mean, they have a privileged access to it. That's in some, some sense the whole problem that um, underground groundwater extraction has been associated with accumulation of wealth. The last question uh, from uh, Smita, and this question, I suppose, is on everybody's minds. With the looming threat of certain Indian cities going thirsty and India having remarkably great water stress, as you showed on the graph, how does the economy of our country get affected in the future? Well, I think um, that's, uh, that's, of course, the central question here and, and, and the big why. Um, <clears throat> I'm not uh, uh, completely pessimistic about the future because I think uh, most uh, models of future climatic change suggests that the existing water bodies in India will hold more water in future than, than, than in the past. Um, that has something to do with the faster snow melt in the Himalayas and also uh, possibly more rainfall, more of the hydrologic cycle that uh, creates the monsoon, uh, a more active uh, monsoon. Uh, we don't know the answer. And we don't know whether it's all uh, necessarily good news because there's, there's clearly going to be much more seasonal variation as well. Um, but I'm not uh, particularly pessimistic about the water conditions in future. I think uh, what is more likely going to happen is not that cities will go outright uh, thirsty, but they will have to go, um, well, the immediate solution will be to extract groundwater a little bit harder, um, but under, uh, uh, Possibly a little. Uh, I mean, there's already quite a lot of legal and uh, and political discussion about protecting groundwater. So there is uh, that that that's building up to the institutional and political resistance to over extraction. So I think it's going to be a combination of the two. There will be more um, serious preservation effort, as well as harder groundwater extraction and uh, preservation 
and, and conservation of different kinds, uh, conservation of surface water. For some time ago, you remember, we had this uh, uh, discussion about a crazy plan to uh, extend river water sharing uh, by crisscrossing canals, north-south canals, which is, which is a pretty crazy plan because all the rivers were uh, in bad shape at that time. But, um, but something like that, I mean, not exactly uh, river linking measures, but more um, conservation of surface water, but not this big dam model, something else, uh, impounding rainwater. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's also very promising. And I think that's going to be the future as well. Right, all good things must come to an end. We have to draw the line somewhere. Thank you for a very uh, remar a remarkable uh, evening. I'm sorry to those who asked questions, but whose questions couldn't be asked. Uh, can I uh, request my uh, colleague on the library committee, Professor Choitali Mitro, to deliver uh, the vote of thanks? Good evening, everybody. The chairpersons and the other members of the Bengal Club Library Subcommittee joins me in thanking Professor Teet Thankar Roy for today's talk, which was very, very thought provoking and was presented with extreme clarity, which unleashed a series of questions and answers, which have been particularly brilliant. Thank you, Professor Roy, for being with us. A big thank you to all the participants and the people who are associated for organizing today's evening. Thank you all. Goodbye and good night. Good night. Thank you, thank you again, Professor Roy. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Bye. 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 Good night.